Um, and um, good afternoon for those of you who are out West. Uh, I'm, I'm Dr. Georges Benjamin. I'm the executive director at the American Public Health Association here in Washington, DC. And I wanna to welcome to this webinar on learning to live with COVID-19 uh, brought to you by the American Public Health Association and the National Academy of Medicine. Now today's webinar has been approved for one and a half continuing education credits um, for CHESS, CNE, CNE, and CPH. Um, the following speakers have no financial commercial relationships to disclose um, from this online uh, educational activity. And we do have one speaker, um, Dr. Walter Orstein, who has um, a relationship with uh, commercial interests that he wanted to disclose. As you can see, he's a member of the Scientific Advisory Board uh, or Moderna. Now, please note that if you want continuing education credits, you have to register with your first and last name. And everyone who wants credit must have their own registration and watch today's event in its entirety. Um, all the participants from today will receive an email within a few days from the uh, a website um, email cpd at confex.com. That's cpd at confex.com. And it'll have information on how to claim your credits. Now, all online evaluations must be submitted by July 7th of this year uh, to receive continuing education credit. Now, if you have any questions or topics you'd like to address today or on future webinars, please enter them in the Q&A box, or you can email us at APHA at APHA.org. So that's Q&A box or emailing us at APHA at APHA.org. And if you experience technical difficulty during the webinar, please enter your concerns in the Q&A and please pay attention to the chat for announcements about how to troubleshoot. Um, we've had, had that happen and that's a great place to get that information. This webinar will be recorded and the recording and transcript will be available on covid19conversations.org. More information on the series and recordings of past webinars are also available at that link. Now I'd like to thank my co-sponsor, the National Academy of Medicine President, Dr. Victor Zhao, as well as co-chairs of our webinar series advisory group, Drs. Carlos Del Rios of Emory University and Dr. Nikki Laurie, who's the former Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response at HHS. And without further ado, I wanna turn turns over to our moderator for today's webinar, um, Dr. Aaron Carroll. Uh, Dr. Carroll is the Associate Dean for Research Mentoring at the University of Indiana School of Medicine. He's also a contributing opinion writer at the New York Times, where he recently published an essay titled, When Can We Be Declared a Pandemic Over? Dr. Carroll, over to you. Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Benjamin, and thank you to everyone who's joining us. Um, when we talk about learning to live with the pandemic, uh, even that title, I think, comes as a surprise to some. Uh, for some time, of course, we have been talking about how things have been very bad uh, and that we need to take significant safety measures until the vaccines arrived, and, but things have been starting to look better in many parts of the country. But even so, there is still a perception among many that this is over when the disease is gone and that we are going to, in the near future, potentially get to somewhere where we could declare everything done and go back to our normal lives. Uh, but evidence is mounting that that's not going to happen. Uh, I think many people never thought it was, but certainly more people are coming to that conclusion every day. Uh, vaccines are being taken, but not at the high rates we might hope. Uh, the disease and its prevalence and positivity rates have been dropping, but not as quickly and as close to zero as we'd like. Um, in a bad flu, or a good flu season, uh, nearly 100 people a day uh, might die of influenza. And we have yet learned to live with that. Now, for years, many of us have said, we wish people would all get vaccinated and wash their hands more rigorously uh, and stay home when they're sick and perhaps drive that number down even lower. But it's clear that we as a country are willing to tolerate a certain level of risk and still go about a normal level of life. And it's becoming clear that that's likely what we're gonna have to do with COVID. We're going to have to learn to live with it. Now, of course, there'll be things we need to talk about still. What do we do with vaccinations? What are the long-term strategies? Will we need to revaccinate? There are things to discuss about how do we monitor 
and how do we keep track of what's going on uh, in states, in cities, and the country as a whole. There are things to determine in how we create public policy, how we might determine how to go back into normal ways of life and restart the economy and do everything that we need to do. All of these things are things we're going to have to learn on the fly, uh, and they're important discussions to have. Luckily, today we have uh, a number of experts who are going to help walk us through many of these parts. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the presenters for today's session. Dr. Walter Ornstein is a professor and associate director of the Emory Vaccine Center, a professor at Emory University School of Medicine, and director of the Emory UGA Center of Excellence for Influenza Research and Surveillance. He's a past director of the U.S. Immunization Program at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Jonay Khaldun is chief medical executive for the state of Michigan and chief deputy director for health in the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Previously, she was the director and health officer for the Detroit Health Department and the chief medical officer for Baltimore City. We also have Dr. Joseph Finns, who's the E. William Davis Jr. MD Professor of Medical Ethics and Chief of the Division of Medical Ethics at Weill Cornell Medical College. He's also the founding chair of the Ethics Committee of New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell Medical Center and the Solomon Center Distinguished Scholar in Medicine, Bioethics, and the Law at Yale Law School. And last but not least, we'll have Mayor Kate Gallego, that's who's the mayor of Phoenix, Arizona. She's the second elected female mayor in the, in the city's history and the youngest big city mayor in the United States. She graduated from Harvard University and earned an MBA from the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Ornstein, I'll turn, thing, turn things over to you to get started and then we'll go through other presenters. Thank you very much. My focus today will be on the continuing role of vaccination with regard to controlling this pandemic epidemic and the importance of vaccines to optimize disease prevention and return to normal. Can I have the next slide, please? I grew up in the Bronx, spent the first 24 years of my life there. The New York Yankees were king at the time. And Yogi Berra was a very famous catcher and he had a lot of quotes. And one of my favorites is, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. And that's part of the problem is there's a lot we don't know. It's a lot easier to be a historian and look backwards at what you should have done than to have to make history when you don't know all you want to know. But we have to do that and we will try to do that as well as we can. Next slide, please. Will we be able to stop vaccination? I think fairly certainly this virus will not eradicate itself. And even if we eliminate sustained transmission in the United States, we will still need to vaccinate. This is a global problem. The viruses are circulating around the world. There's only one disease we've eradicated globally, smallpox, which allowed us to stop vaccination. And we have examples where we've gotten rid of transmission in the US, but we continue to vaccinate, uh, sustained transmission, I should say, measles and polio because the viruses circulate elsewhere in the world and imports can occur. With regard to COVID-19, imports to the US will likely occur even if we interrupt transmission. And regardless of whether we need to revaccinate or change vaccines, New susceptibles will be added to the pool every year with new births. So we will not be able in the foreseeable future to stop vaccination, in my opinion. Next slide, please. Will we need to revaccinate people already vaccinated? And here, I'm a little bit more uncertain. I think it's likely we will, but we don't know for sure. What do we not know yet that would be important? One is the duration of immunity induced by current vaccines. These vaccines were, were uh, given emergency use authorization, and hence we don't know how long immunity will last, but it's likely it's not going to last a lifetime that we will need to do boosters. The second issue, is that mutations of the SARS-CoV-2 viruses potentially could lead to evasion of vaccine-induced immunity, such as with influenza, 
And we may need to revaccinate not only with the same vaccine, but modify the vaccine to take into account and induce antigens that are in the mutants or variants so that it, vaccines will work. It also may be that we may need to get in certain settings higher immunity than our current vaccines can deliver. An example of that is measles. We thought with measles, which had about a 93% effectiveness in a single dose, was good enough to get us through. And then we saw outbreaks, particularly in colleges and then some in high schools and middle schools where the force of infection was higher, that we needed to get even higher immunity levels. And we went to a two dose schedule. So we'll have to see what happens. But the bottom line is we don't know, but it's likely and it's also very important that we do the studies now so that we are prepared to initiate revaccination when we feel we have enough data to support that. Next slide, please. Will future outbreaks be widespread or in clusters? And that again, will I don't really know. It will depend on the level of vaccination coverage we achieve and the duration of immunity among vaccinees. If waning immunity is common or if virus mutations are common evading vaccine-induced immunity, there will be gaps in immunization coverage around the country that will lead to widespread outbreaks. If waning immunity is not a, a major problem, future outbreaks will likely cluster in pockets of under-immunized under individuals. For example, we nearly lost our measles elimination status in 2019 with outbreaks lasting many, many months in subpopulations, particularly in New York State, or places where the force of infection is high, such as densely populated urban settings. I think this calculation of herd immunity thresholds can be misleading because we are not a homogeneous population. They give us targets, but we need to remember that the force of infection may vary in different populations and that we may need higher immunity levels in certain populations, such as densely populated urban areas than we do in sparsely populated uh, rural areas. Next slide, please. All of this says we need ongoing surveillance and ongoing studies to determine a variety of things. One, vaccine effectiveness in a real world setting, which can help us determine waning immunity, variant of, uh, uh, escape, and also potentially if vaccines are not handled appropriately, lose their potency because they're not kept in the cold chain appropriately. When outbreaks occur, we need to determine whether it's a result of vaccine failure or failure to vaccinate or both. We need to understand whether variants emerge which evade vaccine-induced immunity. And the World Health Organization has developed guidelines for methodologies to assess vaccine effectiveness. And you can uh, get to those guidelines at the website shown below. Next slide, please. This is a slide we developed back in 1985, uh, looking at three things. One, PPV is the pop proportion of the population vaccinated, the vaccine coverage. PCV is the proportion of cases that are vaccinated. And then you have individual lines at a given vaccine effectiveness uh, that and which can tell you the proportion of cases with a vaccine history you might expect given a certain population coverage and vaccine effectiveness. So for example, if you have a 90% effective vaccine with 90% population coverage, you will expect if you have cases, about 50% of your cases to have a history of vaccination. To put that in perspective, if you have a thousand people, that 90% are vaccinated, that's 900 vaccinated, 10% are susceptible, that's 90 susceptibles, 100 are unvaccinated and susceptible. So that's roughly 50-50. Uh, and if you have cases, it'll be roughly 50-50. 
On the other hand, if you have a 50% effective vaccine given to 50% of the population, you would expect roughly a third of your cases will have a history of vaccination. So if you have 1,000 people, you have 500 who are unvaccinated and susceptible of the vaccinated, uh, 250 of the 500 vaccinated are susceptible. So 250 of the 750 or one third are vaccine failures. Next slide, please. Now there are a variety of observational studies that can be done. One is cohort studies where you look at the incidence rate of disease in vaccinees versus non-vaccinees and you can calculate effectiveness. There's traditional case control studies where you look at the vaccination cases, status of cases, you select controls that are matched to the cases for most characteristics and look at their vaccination status and you can actually calculate vaccine effectiveness. One of the most popular methods is called the test negative case control design. It was uh, really is the standard now for measuring influenza vaccine effectiveness. And what is done is when people seek care with a COVID compatible illness and are tested, the cases are those that are test positive and the controls are those that test negative. And you can look at their vaccination status and calculate vaccine effectiveness. The screening method was determined to, to help people decide when me more methodologically rigorous methods were needed. And what you do there is you look at the vaccination status of the cases you see, and you look for some source of what's the overall population vaccination, and then use that graph that I showed you just before, and you can measure effectiveness. And if it's within expected bounds, you probably do nothing, if it's not, then you need to do more methodologically rigorous uh, methods. And there are other methods. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, COVID-19 vaccination will likely need to be ongoing. The need for boosters, the frequency of such boosters if needed, and the composition of booster vaccines if not needed is not known at this time but we need to do the studies to look at the safety, the immunogenicity, and have systems in place to monitor effectiveness and determine where the cases we see are vaccine failure versus failure to vaccinate. If vaccine failure, why? Waning immunity, variant escape, improper handling, et cetera. And if failure to vaccinate, why? Problems with access, hesitancy, et cetera, and we then develop solutions based on what the cause of the problem is. I think we can control this uh, disease. I think we can terminate transmission, but it means we need to get high levels of vaccination in all populations, and we need to sustain that, and then we need to modify with boosters if, uh, uh, and changes in vaccines, depending on waning immunity and whether variants uh, emerge that escape the vaccines we have. Thank you. Thank you to Dr. Ornstein for, for those remarks. Uh, next up is going to be Dr. Joan A. Caldoun. So good afternoon uh, or good morning for some, wherever you may be. I'm excited to talk about Michigan's experience with, with COVID-19. You can go ahead to the next slide. Uh, and then the next slide, actually. Um, so this shows Michigan's cumulative case counts for COVID-19 compared to just a select few other states. So Michigan is the purple line there, and this shows kind of cases over time. So Michigan actually was one of the uh, most hardest hit states early on, particularly in our Southeast kind of metropolitan Detroit area. Um, our governor was very proactive, <clears throat> excuse me, in implementing her stay at home orders. And we saw our, our cases come down significantly uh, in kind of the end of April of 2020. And you can see that depicted here on the curve. Nope, stay on that one. <laughs> um, we then had a surge, you can see right about the 250 uh, ticker mark there. You can see that we had a surge in the fall 
um, and put very targeted restrictions in place. And quite frankly, we, we largely in Michigan avoided the post-holiday surge that occurred in, in January. And you can see there right around the 300 uh, uh, per 100K case count, so 300 days, I'm sorry. You can see how Michigan's purple curve flattened out a bit where you saw some of those select other states there where the cases still increased significantly. And then you can see towards the end there, um, where we see that last deflection of, of, the, of the curve, uh, where Michigan had most recently this past spring, a significant increase in our cases and a surge <clears throat> that other states um, didn't quite have. But I think what this really shows is that cumulatively, that surge has actually brought Michigan um, on a similar level to other states when it comes to the number of COVID-19 cases. And I will say that I'm very pleased that over the past six weeks or so, we've seen a significant decrease uh, in our case counts and our positivity rates, hospitalizations, and of course, uh, deaths, which we're very pleased by. But I thought it was really important to kind of show how Michigan's curve has played out compared to some other states. Next slide. So this is another depiction of, of Michigan's curve, but this one particularly um, pulls out racial and ethnic disparities, which I think is really, really important to talk about when we talk about COVID-19 um, and, and public health in general. <laughs> And so unfortunately, um, Michigan saw um, significant disparities due to inequities that were not a surprise, quite frankly, in COVID-19. Um, you can see the purple line there is a Black and African-American residents. Uh, Black residents make up about 14% of Michigan's population. But very early on, Black residents were about 32% of cases and 40% 40, 40 of, of deaths here in the state. And you can see as our, as our COVID cases and as the pandemic moved on, we were actually able to, by implementing very strategic and targeted uh, interventions, we were actually able to essentially eliminate the black-white disparity uh, here in Michigan when it came to COVID-19 cases and deaths. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. It actually did continue through our fall surge. Um, and unfortunately, in our most recent spring surge, we were unable to continue that, I think largely because of our difference in, um, <clears throat> in vaccination rates. But again, it's really important to say that when you are intentional about disparities, you can actually do something about them. So next slide. So what, what did Michigan do exactly? So again, I, I think intentionality. So first, we were actually one of the first states to even look for the data when it came to uh, testing and deaths and, and, and racial disparities. And so one is just identifying the issue in the first place. Um, we then worked very closely with community members to actually develop solutions and implement those solutions. So our governor actually announced um, a, a racial disparities task force. I think we were one of the first in the country to have a, such a task force that was really made up of community members, academia, um, faith-based leaders, many people who know boots on the ground, what's happening in their communities. And we were able to actually develop and target strategies, particularly in our marginalized and minoritized communities that I do believe contributed to our, our case rates coming down and that disparity really being eliminated in, in last year's surges. So we declared, our, our governor declared racism as a public health crisis. And with that came a lot of, um, for state government particularly, a lot of um, interventions with implicit bias training, changing the way in the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, how we move forward with allocating our dollars, how we move forward with hiring staff, we actually um, put in place a multi-million dollar media campaign targeted specifically um, in the southeastern Michigan area um, using people who uh, we thought were trusted community members who distributed over six million free masks. Um, we also had a lot of uh, early on free neighborhood-based testing sites providing over 24,000 free tests. Um, and that was really important. As you all recall, over a year ago, we were very limited in our ability to obtain a test and there were disparities in who was actually getting a test. And I think this really helped address that. We partnered with several community-based organizations, actually gave uh, funding to a lot of those organizations to implement on the ground interventions. We did a lot of human service support and we expanded our SNAP benefits. We actually provided quarantine support uh, with food, hygiene products. We actually supported our elderly as well, making sure they had access to the resources that they needed. And we also mandated right off the bat 
reporting from our providers when it came to testing, reporting race and ethnicity. And then as I already mentioned, implicit bias training um, for all state employees. And um, we actually successfully have now implemented mandatory uh, implicit bias training for everyone in the state of Michigan who's a healthcare professional as a condition of you renewing or receiving your license. Well, next slide. So we, we've also um, been very targeted and strategic in our, in our vaccination efforts. Um, and so from the very beginning, when there was very limited uh, amount of uh, vaccine and our supply demand is, was not what it is today, we had to divide um, our, our, our doses up amongst our counties. And we, from the very beginning, used the social vulnerability index. So looking at things like poverty, uh, educational status in a home, race, ethnicity, uh, whether someone's first language is, is English. So all the things that go into social vulnerability index, we actually use that as a factor when it came to how many vaccines went out into a particular community. It's not a surprise that many of the communities that had a high SBI index also were hardest hit by COVID-19. So again, not a surprise. So we actually did that very early on, targeting our vaccination efforts. We also, and this was uh, prior actually to it being done at the national level, we actually gave our vaccines directly to dialysis centers. So those who are taking care of some of our most, our most vulnerable. And we also gave our vaccines to our <clears throat> federally qualified health centers as well, knowing that they often are taking care of the most vulnerable. So the, the point here is with our vaccination efforts and what we need to think about moving forward to the point of living with COVID-19, being very intentional, uh, targeted, strategic when it comes to equity and how you're working with communities when it comes to access to testing, as I talked about earlier, but also vaccines. Um, we implemented actually something I'm very proud of. We implemented a special project, special pilot program. Essentially it was an RFP for vaccines where we actually had folks who had developed these partnerships, maybe worked with their local health department or not in some cases, and they actually had to apply to receive vaccines based on how well they were targeting um, their vaccination efforts based on access, disability status, even um, transportation, making sure they were eliminating those barriers. So really proud of that. <clears throat> and then of course, communication is just so very important uh, when it comes to vaccination efforts. We, in December, so right when the vaccines were uh, rolling out, we actually implemented a bipartisan Protect Michigan Commission. So really a coalition of uh, multiple, again, bipartisan, more than 60 people, community leaders who are really carrying the message about the safety, efficacy of the, of the vaccines. They're hosting town halls. They're doing press conferences. So it's not just me and, and, and government officials who are, are sharing the message, but really getting out into the community, which I think is really, really important. Next slide. So I, I think another thing that's been really important in Michigan's approach to battling COVID-19 has been our robust testing strategy. Of course, we all know early on we weren't able to test broadly, but as we've gotten more access to testing, we've really wanted to make sure there was equitable access. Um, we have really made sure we had early identification of outbreaks and of course, focused on protecting the, the vulnerable. So really why the accessible and free community testing, which I've already talked about a little bit, neighborhood-based free testing sites. So sites at, at churches, community-based organizations that are in communities, really, really important. We've also more recently put testing, free testing at points of entry into the state. So we have testing actually available at airports, uh, available at rest areas throughout the state. We do have a large state, so a lot of people drive back and forth across the state. That's been really, really important. We've also had some testing requirements and mandates within orders in the state, including with our jail population, our, our long-term care settings. We actually had a testing requirement for agricultural settings, which was really important, knowing that's where a lot of uh, outbreaks were, were occurring. We also, with our most recent surge uh, in the state, we actually implemented a mandatory uh, weekly testing for uh, youth aged 13 to 19. So mandatory asymptomatic kind of surveillance screening for any child who wanted to participate in sports. And that is because early on, 
we saw with this most recent surge that there were a lot of sports outbreaks. And so we wanted to support continuing uh, people being able to do the things that they want to do, again, to the message of living with COVID. But we wanted to make sure if there was a positive case on the team, we identified it early and that person was not a, a threat to, to other people on the team. So that was really, really important. And then we also have made testing widely available for free um, at, at all schools across the entire state. And so we've actually trained many of the, the schools, they've gotten their CLIA waivers, and they're actually implementing a lot of school testing. Again, it's important that our children have in-person uh, learning. And so testing has been a part of that. And of course, as, as was just discussed by my colleague, moving forward, thinking about how we're doing surveillance, making sure we're identifying any outbreaks very rapidly. I do believe that as we move forward with living with COVID, it's not going to be necessarily chasing every single case, but making sure uh, that we do have really robust regional surveillance mechanisms in place for identifying any outbreaks, for identifying any breakthrough vaccines and understanding if there are any signals there, that means we, that means that we need to pivot and respond differently. So overall, very proud of our, our response in Michigan. We are seeing a decrease in cases from our recent surge, but I think moving forward, we all have to pivot and be able to one, focus on equity, but also as we think about testing, surveillance, how we work with communities, pivot as well so that we don't see disparate impact of COVID-19 in, in some communities. So thank you very much. I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Carroll. Thank you so much to Dr. Khaldun. Uh, our third presenter is Dr. Joseph Finns. Thank you. Um, so I've been asked to talk about some of the ethical choices we'll face in a post-pandemic world when the virus is endemic, a chronic feature of civic life, not the catastrophic, nearly existential threat that we faced for the last 17 months, and to try and consider some of the trade-offs between acceptable levels of risk and mortality as we move into this new normal. It's a hopeful time to look ahead to a post-pandemic world um, as infections rates have fallen to 30,000 per day. Uh, and with more than 61% of adults uh, and 49% of all Americans having received at least one shot, it's really tempting to take this victory lap and imagine an endemic America and the choices we'll need to make. But before we do this, we need to look back and remember the pre-pandemic America that made us so vulnerable to COVID-19 despite our wealth and scientific prowess, both intellectual and institutional, given the capabilities of the NIH and the CDC, as well as the private sector. George Packer, in a brilliant essay published in The Atlantic last June, wrote of the underlying conditions that made us prone to the pandemic, and the list is familiar. Distrust in government and scientific expertise, our divisive and dysfunctional politics, and economic and health disparities, these pre-existing conditions will be with us um, as COVID becomes endemic and will complicate our value choices. Our national recovery is not happening in a vacuum. Those who are sanguine about recent progress need to recall the broader health status of the body politic moving forward. Can I have the first slide, please? I. Um, saw some of these challenges firsthand uh, leading an ethics consultation service at a major academic medical center during the spring surge in New York City. In retrospect, there were three challenges we faced last spring that will make ethical choices more difficult in an endemic America. They are political realism, structural inequities, and the limits of American bioethics to address questions of distributive justice. Can I have the next slide, please? Let's start with uh, political realism and an, and an anecdote, which is really a parable or a story with a moral lesson. I'm a member of the New York State Task Force on Life and the Law and helped to draft the 2015 Task Force Report on Ventilator Allocation Guidelines. It was written in anticipation of and in preparation for an avian flu pandemic. And it had nationwide impact when COVID-19 struck last year, while not perfect by any stretch of the imagination it became the most discussed approach to allocating ventilators in the face of dire scarcity. During our deliberations as a task force, before it was published back in 2015, I vividly recall being obsessed with the question of when guidelines would become operative. It seemed critical to understand when and how clinical practice and associated health law would make the radical shift 
from the deontological to the utilitarian. I wanted to know as precisely as possible the conditions under which a governor would declare a public health emergency that could trigger such an allocation scheme. And I wanted to know what would happen to existing law under these circumstances. It seemed to me as unlikely as the need for triage would be, we were living in this era of naivete, we would know when and how it would be initiated and how medical practice would proceed under what is called crisis standards of care. I remember raising these issues over the course of several task force meetings. First, I was ignored, but I persisted and I received a response. As I recall, I was told we just couldn't go there. The task force couldn't release a report getting into what a governor might be allowed to do or could do during a public health emergency. It would scare people and be bad politics. I pushed back and said that it was our responsibility to lay this out before a crisis struck. After all, what was the purpose of the task force but to take on politically hot topics that were too toxic or contentious for normal political challenges? Well, you know the rest of this story. We never articulated precisely how and when a governor could invoke crisis standards of care. This left us unprepared for the pandemic despite having written a report about it five years earlier. When the pandemic came, we were still asking these questions, but it was easier to avoid them and to build up capacity than to acknowledge the gravity of the shortages felt in the state. To assert then or now that there was sufficient personnel and supplies is to engage in historical fiction. And it's a position that is, that is countered by a March 2021 report from the um, Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General that found that hospitals were severely strained by the pandemic and that many were operating in survival mode. Second point, and if I could have the next slide, are structural uh, iniquities that exist and the fair allocation of resources during the crisis. This became all the more pressing because of the disproportionate morbidity and mortality experienced by communities of color during the pandemic. This burden was a consequence of longstanding health disparities, the vulnerability of essential workers, many of whom are persons of color, as well as what I'm gonna call the built environment. A remarkable research report published in JAMA back in April, 2020 spoke to this. And these are where these slides are from. It's com it compared the morbidity and mortality of COVID-19 in New York's five boroughs. Not surprisingly, the Bronx had the highest hospitalization and death rates consistent with the sociodemographic characteristics of its population, reflected in a poverty rate of 27.4%. But then there was this surprise. Even though Queens had one of the lowest poverty rates in New York City of 11.5%, only Staten Island was slightly better at 11.4%, Queens had the second highest worst mortality rate. The reason for this disparity was not about the population of, of Queens residents, but Queens's built environment. As compared to 534 hospital beds per 100,000 in Manhattan, Queens had only 144 per 100,000, the lowest per capita rate in New York City. This was a health equity issue that could have been addressed with centralized efforts to transport patients from bed poor regions to, of the city to ones with more resources, this might have been possible if the state had articulated health equity as an ethical priority and then acknowledged that both scarcity existed and that resources were unfairly uh, distributed. Can I have the next slide, please? My third concern is the limits of bioethics, my, my profession. As many of you know, bioethics was a phrase coined in 1973 and was a response to the Nazi atrocities in medicine, the Tuskegee syphilis study, and challenges posed by increasingly sophisticated medical practice. Bioethics called for including the patient's voice in care decisions and affirmation of their rights, and a focus on four principles, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. But along the way, one of those principles was prized to the exclusion of others. A European bioethicist once told me with irony that American medicine followed four ethical principles, autonomy and three others he could not recall. But with the elevation of autonomy, the pursuit of the other three principles, the promotion of good, the avoidance of harm, and the passion for social justice was diminished. These limitations were laid bare by the pandemic. 
bioethics needs to move beyond narrow questions of patient choice, particularly when the disenfranchised are not in a position to exercise that choice. Can I have the next slide, please? This was the predicate uh, that we confront looking at the at endemic COVID. Returning to George Packer's prescient article, he observed, quote, that the virus should have united Americans against a common threat. The virus also should have been a great leveler. You don't have to be in the military or in debt to be a target. You just have to be human. But those divisions persist. We can point to a deadly virus, but the virus did what it was programmed to do. It found hosts, it replicated, it mutated, and it moved on. It wasn't viremia that caused all the harm, it was human nature. That was the pathology that needs to be addressed if we wanna talk about the value choices and the trade-offs that we will encounter in an endemic America. But there are no simple answers to what is an acceptable mortality rate. Numbers are not easily translated into values, nor will decisions about van the vac vaccine mandates be easy to make. But there are better and worse conversation about these choices, which are often cast as communal responsibility in opposition to individual liberty. Personally, I think that's a false choice and that we're freer to return to a normal life if we work together and more of us got vaccinated. But my saying so will not convince those who hold opposite views. Instead, we need to, need to lay the foundation for better conversations about deliberative democracy, about science and about medicine. This will be a multi-year task akin to the moonshot that seeks to repair the body politic and our civic discourse. I may be heading out of my lane here, but let me suggest an approach about what we need to do to talk about COVID as it becomes endemic. Could I have the next slide? First, we need to mourn and reflect on our losses. We have to acknowledge, as of the other day, 590,000 deaths in the United States, and let's not forget the 33 million deaths worldwide. It's been repeated so often, it has almost lost the force of its content. But we've lost more Americans from the pandemic than all the wars our nation has ever fought. We need to remember our pain to become inspired to do better. Do we need a national memorial? I think we do. Do we need a day of remembrance? I think we do. Both of those things would be of symbolic importance, would honor the dead and all those who did their best to save their lives. Second, we need to affirm our solidarity and acknowledge our shared vulnerability in the face of the pandemic and other collective threats. Though many have felt alone, it's only collective action that will bring us through. Third, we need to be inclusive in our responses. We need to imagine Rawls's veil of ignorance and forget our privilege and our vulnerabilities and imagine what a just healthcare response would look like. It should be fair to people of color, essential workers, as well as those with disabilities. And when we talk about distributive justice, all of these communities, as they seem to be in Michigan in their dialogue, they need to be represented. Could I have the next slide, please? Fourth, we have to prepare our citizenry for these conversations. To that end, we need to promote STEM education and the humanities. Good facts lead to good ethics and critical thinking is needed for both. To invoke C.P. Snow's two cultures, our response to the pandemic is a quintessential two culture problem. All of society's complex problems are at least a two culture problem, if not more, whether it's a pandemic or climate change. Science alone cannot address the problem of vaccination if there is hesitancy or global warming if it's denied. Fifth, we need to stress the importance of history and civic education. To understand the importance of governor, government's role, both at the federal and state levels and all branches of government, our citizenry needs to learn our history, both the good and the bad, what government did well and when it went astray. And I hope you can see this image on the bottom part of the slide on the left, here reflects both the public health clinics built by the WPA and the public health services Tuskegee syphilis study 
contemporaneous government actions. Finally, we need to promote equity here and abroad. Initiatives like COVAX are not a charitable enterprise, but are protective of our domestic national security, as much as it is respectful of others around the globe. So let me close on a sobering note and where we began. As the pandemic becomes endemic domestically, it will remain a pandemic globally for most of the world. And just because things are getting better here does not absolve us of global responsibility. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much to Dr. Fins for those remarks. Uh, last but not least, of course, we turn to Mayor Kate Gallego, who's uh, going to speak with us. Wonderful. Greetings from Phoenix, Arizona. I am honored to join you all today, and I want to begin by saying thank you to the medical and public health professionals who have made a tough situation a little bit better and who have given so much over the course of this pandemic. For me as a local elected official, collaboration with our health professionals has been one of the, the uh, bright spots of this pandemic, and I am grateful to those who changed their priorities or who consulted with us or um, who spoke out in the media and made it a little bit easier to navigate this pandemic. I uh, want to thank Dr. Carlos Del Rio with Emory, who early on in the pandemic was a key advisor to me as I made decisions about how Phoenix should move forward. Um, and I want to thank all of you who have done that for your local elected officials and, and mayors. I know we are not done with this, but I think even partway through the pandemic, it's important to, to say thank you and to recognize that we as elected officials cannot do it without health professionals. Today, I was asked to talk a little bit about how elected officials make decisions, and there certainly is no one answer. Uh, we are a diverse group, but I will talk about some of the things we experienced in Arizona and are still continuing to experience, as well as how we made our decisions in the city of Phoenix. Uh, for me, the pandemic first ha hit home in January of 2020. We had a university student who'd been in Wuhan and who returned to Phoenix through the airport and was diagnosed with COVID-19. Uh, we uh, began our response uh, by making sure he had health care, but also uh, setting up a tracking system. Um, and that was how contact tracing uh, began for us on, on this particular effort. Uh, we also coded his home in the regional 911 system so that uh, there would be a different public health response than uh, just a firefighters going in if there were a 911 call um, in case of emergency. And um, luckily, that was a successful outcome. There were uh, no transmissions that we're aware of from that first case. Um, so COVID continued uh, throughout the country, and there was more spread in other communities than ours. Um, our next big milestone came in March. I was uh, just about to hit my first year as mayor, so COVID hit during year one, and we saw the virus spreading throughout the country. Um, in Arizona, the response really began with mayors and executive orders. So by executive order, uh, we put in protections, including trying to restrict some of the most risky areas for virus transmission, uh, particularly settings such as bars and nightclubs. Um, so to, to decide whether or not to do my executive order, I consulted with a variety of different health professionals, including Dr. Del Rio. Uh, we also spoke with our healthcare system and my conversations with healthcare CEOs were very impactful for me. Um, some of our CEOs talked in great detail about the heartbreaking decisions we could be asking medical professionals to make, um, the lack of resources available and, and the idea of choosing who gets a ventilator and who does not. Uh, they spoke with me in detail about the fact that in Phoenix, Arizona, we did not have enough healthcare beds and resources even before the pandemic. Uh, Phoenix has been the fastest growing city in the country and we are in the fastest growing county in the country. Um, because of 
a variety of different factors, including how we uh, allocate graduate medical education in this country. We, we um, did not have as many physicians as we needed. And we also had a pretty significant shortage of nurses even before COVID-19. So that discussion was very important to me, but I, I also spoke with our business community about what it would mean if we took public health seriously. And the leader of the Phoenix Chamber of Commerce was, was very supportive of moving forward with health restrictions. Um, our local universities were also very important and we talked with them about what were the capabilities and the risks in our community. And ultimately I decided it did make sense to move forward by executive order. That's an unusual experience for a mayor. As you heard in my background, I, I do have an MBA and I'm very interested in economic development, growing high wage jobs and businesses. So it wasn't where I thought I would be going to put restrictions in place, but given the spread of the virus and the lack of healthcare resources, I thought it was the responsible decision um, as a new mayor, I got a lot of advice from different people and many people told me not to take this risk uh, that would be politically damaging for me. I won in a special election. So I um, was sworn in in 2019, but then I had to run again in 2020. And I did get advice from people who said, don't do this. Uh, your political career will be over. But ultimately I decided there were some things that are worth losing the job for and, and that it was the right decision to put these protections in place that I wanted to err on the side of public health. And I feel very good about that uh, now, but it was an interesting process to go through. It's been a tough time in local government and, and I have great sympathy for people who made the opposite decisions of mine as well. Uh, COVID in many ways as elected official made you feel like you were choosing between two bad options. You don't want to deprive anyone of their livelihood. But in my case, I was also very concerned about protecting lives in our community. Um, we continued to work directly with health professionals and I consulted particularly often with our healthcare business leaders and local university. But there were other networks that were important to me uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies engaged John Hopkins and a few other um, public health programs in providing consulting for mayors. The data for John Hopkins was really useful to me in, in making sure we had good analytics uh, to make decisions and also we're making policy decisions based on what was working elsewhere in the country. Um, we had real challenges locally in Arizona. Our uh, governor who is in charge of the public health response, said he was making decisions based on models, but would not release them. And that was difficult. At one point, he just paused modeling completely, uh, particularly when the models were saying that COVID was going to get uh, significantly worse. So those national networks were important to me, but we also had global conversations. I belong to a global group of mayors that works on climate change issues. That group pivoted to focus on COVID. Uh, early in, in the pandemic, we got to hear from uh, Chinese mayors about how they responded. Uh, but two, two mayors were particularly in, uh, impactful for me beyond the Chinese mayors. Uh, Korean mayors were talking about how they put in place testing protocols. And that was very useful for me as, as we thought about what made sense in Arizona. And then we got to hear from Italian mayors about what challenges they were facing. At the time, Italian morgues were filling up and, and beyond capacity. And the, that sense of urgency and just the raw emotion on my Italian counterparts' faces uh, really added to the public health data. So we were all looking at transmission values and the spread of the virus and graphs and, and numbers of people impacted, but hearing from my peers was very impactful as well as closer to home. Unfortunately in Arizona, the first Arizonan to pass due to COVID-19 was a city of Phoenix employee who worked at the airport and was someone who I knew. And when people ask why we responded proactively, I think that personal interaction mattered as well. When I uh, spoke with elected officials who thought we should not be doing as much on COVID, they often were people who did not know anyone personally impacted by it. 
And so they say all politics is personal and that did feel true over the last year. Um, we continued to work uh, locally with our healthcare community on trying to acquire protective equipment. Uh, if you wanna see my inbox, the, the truly stunning number of people who, who knew a guy who had a factory that could produce masks for us, was, it was something else. Um, and that was, that was an, an experience in and of itself. Um, we also took testing very seriously. And even though we are not a public health authority at the local government level in Arizona, we got into the testing business. So we had city employees who um, used to be in, in parks programs that weren't moving forward or, or library programs that weren't moving forward because of health protections, got into registering people and doing logistics for testing. Uh, Phoenix was the largest city in the country through the first months of the pandemic to not receive federal surge testing. And, and I spent a lot of time focused on, on getting that needed healthcare information in our community. Uh, at one point, uh, I got mentioned by name at a White House press conference who said they should that I should stop talking about testing and, and the challenges. And that was also a life-changing moment for me because all over the country, when you get mentioned at a White House press conference, uh, people started following me on social media and interacting and saying that this was a huge lie, um, which was something else. Uh, it was such got to the point that when I got a flu shot and posted it on social media, I had uh, hundreds of people saying, uh, that uh, Bill Gates was going to control my mind or, or different other flu shot conspiracies. Uh, when we put in requirements around masking and others, we would get more than 6,000 emails and 2,000 calls a day, which um, I have a staff of 10. So that was, that was pretty stunning to see all of that coming in and the emotion around masking. Uh, we made our decision by vote of city council in public meeting and, and took public testimony. And I want to say thank you to all the doctors out there who were willing to testify and, and share their expertise. Um, many of them, unfortunately, got negative uh, interactions on social media as a result of it. And um, I am profoundly grateful and sorry that that is the case of, of civil discourse. But we also had people testifying that our mask requirement would deprive Phoenicians of oxygen and was, again, my effort to control minds. Mm. So a lot of this was, was eye-opening experience for me. I am glad we did it, but I, I certainly echo uh, some of the thoughts Dr. Finn just shared about civil discourse in the community and, and how we might move from here and, and have better uh, conversations moving forward. I hope that those of you in the public health and medical professions will find partners in local government and continue to work with us because we will need your help and your partnership if we are gonna emerge from this stronger. I'll just close by saying thank you again for all you've done to get us through such a difficult time. Thank you to Mary Gallego for those remarks. Um, we are right on time, which is fantastic. So thank you from the moderator to our speakers for adhering to the clock so carefully. If everyone wants to bring their camera on, um, I'm gonna start filtering some questions through to people. While I will likely direct them to uh, one of the four of you initially, I encourage anyone who would like to follow up to please do so. Um, this, as much as we can, it'd be great for this to be a dialogue. Um, we're certainly going to want to hear from everybody, and uh, you know, nobody should feel that they need to be called on in order to speak. But I'll start with uh, Dr. Ornstein. Do you see lessons from childhood vaccinations and our history with campaigns to, to help address concerns about either vaccine hesitancy or low rates of uptake and other concerns? Yes, I do. I think there are very important things that came out of uh, our childhood immunization program. For example, the need to have trusted messengers. And what we found uh, is that working with particularly primary care providers was key in overcoming hesitancy. A second is to make vaccines easily available and remove barriers. So one of the things that we did in a presidential initiative in the early 1990s was develop a program where vaccines could be free to some of our poorest children called the Vaccines for Children program. Uh, we also, in our childhood program, have an extensive surveillance system. I kept on mentioning measles because measles was a major force in our building of our program, but 
We had surveillance, we had outbreak investigations, we defined uh, something that is not the best definitions, but preventable and non-preventable cases. A preventable case was one who should have been vaccinated, but was not. And a non-preventable was one either that was a vaccine failure or for whom vaccine had not been recommended. And it helped in moving things. And one of the things that we found was very helpful is, um, is accountability. Uh, one of the things that we got in that presidential initiative uh, uh, in the early 1990s was something called the National Immunization Survey. And the first state uh, that came out at the bottom of the list on immunization coverage was actually Michigan. And uh, the head of the immunization program in Michigan used that and got substantial resources from his state legislature and really built up the immunization program. So we need to try and have that as well. I think part of the problem here is for the most part at the moment, this is an adult immunization program. And for adult immunization, we don't do anywhere near as well as we do in childhood immunization. And my hope is that the focus on COVID will also have benefits in terms of improving our overall adult immunization program. So my next question actually um, probably could go to Dr. Caldoun first, but I would really love to hear from Mayor Gallego as well. Um, one of the things even just mentioned, but one of the things which has not been incredibly popular in our response so far in the United States has been surveillance. Uh, the use of, some people have advocated for the use of wastewater uh, as a way to, to do sort of high level surveillance, but others have gone so far as to say we should be doing widespread either antigen testing or, or other types of testing. Um, what role do you think surveillance should play now and perhaps future? And are there discussions in, in either the state or the city in which uh, you're helping to lead? Yeah, I, I can jump in. So surveillance is actually going to be very, it is currently important. It's going to be very important, I think, as, as we move forward. Uh, I mentioned this kind of at the end of my, my prepared remarks, uh, but as we, as we move forward with COVID-19 and learning to live with it, it's going to be really important that we are identifying signals, kind of going back to what we do with flu, where we have these sentinel surveillance networks set up all across the state. So we're identifying early on uh, of the symptomatic people who actually is, is positive for flu. We're doing that same thing or pivoting to that same thing with COVID-19. And then similar to what was mentioned with, with measles, even over the past couple of years, quickly identifying if there is a positive case and kind of wrapping all of our public health services and rapid testing and, and contact tracing, the things that we're used to doing very robustly now, I think eventually our, our case rates and positivity rates will get so low such that we move towards a broad surveillance, wastewater, antigen testing, uh, focusing on vulnerable populations like long-term care settings, perhaps schools, and then rapidly responding and encircling any, any positive cases, particularly when it's a uh, potential for a, a large outbreak. So surveillance will be incredibly important uh, moving forward. Thank you. We are using wastewater uh, testing as to sort of supplement other testing in our community and it has been helpful. I, I am in Phoenix City Hall now and that's a building where we ended up putting in some restrictions a few months ago because we did through wastewater uh, learn about a some COVID-19 presence. We also have had good luck with mobile testing and particularly going into some of our more vulnerable communities and communities with less access to healthcare. We find if, people, if we make testing a lot easier, people are more likely to do it. So it's uh, free testing with no copay and no insurance required. And that has helped us better understand the, the status of um, COVID-19 in our community. Uh, we, we are trying to be cognizant that many surveillance networks disproportionately provide data on those who are easiest to survey, and that often is not our most vulnerable populations here. Um, so we're trying to be really intentional about that. And um, I also wanted to add a little bit to what Dr. Orenstein said on, on vaccinations and just what's been working in our community and, and what hasn't been. Uh, we have huge disparities 
within the greater Phoenix area. So we have areas in the high 80% of eligible uh, residents being vaccinated and, and some in the low 30s. Uh, income has been a large correlation. And um, some of that is we've spoken to people who say, I work seven days a week. I cannot take a day off. I cannot afford to be sick. We have others who are in mi mixed immigration households and who are concerned about the documentation or that they might become ineligible for citizenship. And that's been a challenge. Uh, we've also had people who just want to have a chance to get their questions answered. Uh, we are lucky at the City of Phoenix to have support from Dr. Heather Ross, who's been working with us and who has done Q&A sessions with our employees from our police officers to the individuals who drive our solid waste trucks. And many people just have heard a rumor or want to see if certain uh, pieces of information apply to them. Uh, many people were deeply concerned about the speed of the development of the vaccine. And so if we were able to talk that mRNA vaccination for a coronavirus was developed over a decade, that, that was meaningful to people and that there, we were preparing for this as, a, as the medical community. So uh, different people have had different concerns and the more we can have individual conversations, the better. Uh, we've also looked at doing incentives for vaccination out here and have tried uh, fun events, lottery tickets, uh, but that has slowed a little bit recently as our legislature has debated a bill that, to make it a felony to uh, incentivize vaccination. So uh, there's impediments from public policy and assistance from public policy, but I do aspire not to become a felon, although I very much want everyone in my community to have access to vaccination. I suppose it's at least an interesting way to become a felon, but uh, yes, nobody should. Um, my next question I'd love to direct to, to Dr. Finns. We had a question come in. Can you elaborate on the U.S. obligation to provide international aid, whether vaccines or other forms of support? And further, what, what moral obligation do wealthy nations have? Well, I, first of all, I think, you know, it is a global pandemic and it's, it's not really charitable because, because you, if you have a breeding ground of, of a pandemic, uh, of, uh, COVID in, in regions that mutations can spawn, um, they're eventually going to come here. So it's in our direct self-interest to, to, to make this a global response. Also, you know, we, we, we're a country of immigrants. We're a country that is full of, I mean, I have colleagues uh, in my next door in my office uh, who have family, um, close family in India. And, and, you know, during the day, they're doctors at night, they're family member doctors. And they're, they're calling to hear how people can get oxygen canisters um, to their loved ones and the like. Um, so I think, you know, we, we're a country that, that comes from all over the world. So we have affiliations with the rest of the world. That's the source of our strength but it's also a source of our obligation. Now, I mean, I think also, you know, I read that, that, that you know, we're approaching 50% vaccination in the United States in, in, in areas in, in South America and in Africa, it's 0.03% of folks have been vaccinated. That's just intolerable. It's bad public policy and it's unethical. It violates every norm about social justice and distributive justice. So I think we have an obligation. What the exact number is, I don't know. I, I would hope to think, that it was our capacity to make vaccines was the limiting factor, not our generosity. I'm gonna push it a little further there. Do, do you think that that, I mean, there was a time when it seems like that might've been the case, but it feels, at least if you listen to the news, that there is vaccine available. Um, how do we make that pivot point to when we should start just moving vaccine that Americans aren't willing to take out of the country? Well, I think we have a surplus. So I don't think it's gonna be you know, at, at the expense of Americans, but I think even if you look at it at a geopolitical level, um, do you want other countries using vaccines for their own political gain? Uh, why not make it a, a, an instrument of, of American diplomacy? Uh, the USAID um, fed people for decades, and that did more for America's standing in the world than armaments. So I, I think we have to look at this globally. I think there's a role for health diplomacy and, and using our talents uh, in the service of, of the world. Thank you. Um, I'm going to throw this one to Dr. Ornstein, but I would absolutely love to hear from any of our panelists. Uh, what do you think an effective masking policy might look like when the disease is endemic? I think it will vary. I'm not an expert in the non-vaccine non issues, 
But I think to me, CDC has put out what I think is reasonable guidance that if you have high vaccination coverage, you uh, can reduce your masking. I think hopefully that can be an incentive for people to get vaccinated. The vaccines we have are highly effective. Uh, they're effective not only against disease and complications and severe disease, but they appear also to decrease transmission, which is another good thing for vaccination. And so my hope would be as, uh, as disease goes down and infection goes down and coverage goes up, that we will begin more and more of unmasking, even for unvaccinated individuals or people who can't be vaccinated, such as those with uh, medical contraindications. Anyone else have thoughts? Well, I, I so I'll move on to another question. In uh, October of 2019, um, or November maybe of 2019, but it was late 2019, I was uh, lucky enough to sit with Dr. Benjamin on a, a panel at the APHA meeting, and we were talking about, the, the topic was, uh, is, is, is public health worth it almost? Is, is it get enough bang for the buck? Uh, and I remember we actually talked about one of the things was that we needed to start having moonshots for, for public health that, uh, that, you know, then not President Biden, but Vice President Biden had pushed for it and that, you know, we were willing to spend huge amounts of money on health care that sometimes is cost effective, but we sometimes demand much a much higher bar for public health. And not long after, we all learned that public health was not only necessary, uh, but was, was just completely underfunded. So I'm going to throw this question first to Mary Gallego, but I definitely would love to hear from Mel Caldoon and anyone else. But can you comment on the challenges related to, you know, an inadequate public health workforce, uh, the inability to do great contact tracing, and how we should go about strengthening that in the future? How do we get better public health? That's a conversation we have been having very regularly in my community. Arizona, I believe, was third from the bottom in per capita public health workforce when this began, and, and we did see the impacts. We got overwhelmed with uh, an inability to do contact tracing early on, and, and our local health authority moved to doing it by, by a text message as opposed to an individual calling you. And, and we had some rough conversations about whether people are willing to be as direct and honest um, with different um, methods or as thoughtful about really everyone you did have contact with. Um, one of the, the silver linings of COVID-19 is we have a huge generation of young people who have experienced how important public health is and our local universities are saying they have ever increasing demand for class coursework, coursework and degrees in this area. So I hope uh, there will be a real call to arm with this generation. I am of the generation who was in school when 9-11 happened, 2001, and so many people in my generation got interested in local government and, and how local government helped respond to things like the attacks. Um, so uh, to me, that was a pivotal moment in my own development, and I suspect COVID-19 will be for so many young people. Uh, we've been trying to make some of our additions permanent because we know this is not the last time we are going to have a crisis. And, and I think there have been lessons to those of us in government that even communities that were prepared uh, because of Ebola are responding better and getting better outcomes than those that had not experienced uh, something like Ebola. So it seems like the evidence is stronger than ever that these investments make sense, that they save lives and that they also improve the economy because making sure we take care of public health is fundamental to economic recovery. Can I add to, can I add to that? I, or, I'm sorry. <laughs> just, I'll, I'll just, I'll I'll just go to read. Dr. Caldoun first, and then, I'll, then absolutely to Dr. Ornstein. Um, there's so much to say here. I, I think one thing that, you know, a lot of folks didn't realize that public health systems were not 
it, it wasn't, you know, push two buttons and then all of a sudden, you know, exactly where someone with COVID-19 was, where the outbreak originated, who all of their contacts were. I mean, from a state health official perspective, uh, it was interesting in the very beginning, people thought we were hiding information and why won't you just tell us? I know you've got three buttons. If you just pushed it, you would tell me. But what they didn't realize is our, our I mean, there are health departments even still today, I think, um, or they're definitely before COVID, using fax machines. I mean, fax machines to get information about a, a infectious disease. Um, there are some uh, health departments didn't even have an epidemiologist, like not even one, or sharing a medical director across like half the state. I mean, that's just the reality of, of what public health uh, has been in this country. And I, and I do hope certainly that, uh, certainly with the funding we're getting from the federal level, we'll be able to build that capacity uh, for our data systems. We've learned a lot about data sharing, interoperability, right? That's really important that our, our data systems actually speak to each other. But I also think some of the silver lining is, Folks who are not necessarily going into public health, so businesses, uh, hospitals, um, others, actually understand how, how they have a role to play in public health, which is really a public health official's dream, because I always say the work of public health is not just about the work of the public health department, it's about everyone contributing to the health of a community. So I think that's a silver lining within this pandemic. Dr. Bornstein? Yeah, my, my, since I'm a vaccinologist, my favorite line is vaccines don't save lives, vaccinations save lives. The vaccine dose that remains in the vial is 0% effective no matter what the clinical trial showed. And it's often harder to sell the infrastructure that is needed to deliver, to provide information, but we need to do that. And hopefully we get a lesson learned from this. There was a lot of investment in vaccine development, but I did not see anywhere near that investment in vaccine delivery and distribution and the like. And I think hopefully that can be a lesson for the future that we need to have that delivery system to get vaccines out of the vials into the bodies of people who need to receive them. Well, then following straight up from that, uh, I'll ask directly to you first, but then of course, anyone else, please jump in. Um, what do you think about the vaccine lotteries we are seeing? Is that a, a good way to spend money? And are there better ways uh, for us to try to use resources to, to increase vaccination rates? Uh, that's a, that's a, a good question and a difficult one to answer. In a sense, what we also need to invest in is what I call implementation science or implementation research to determine what works better than other things. And we've done that in a number of ways. There are a number of, of things we undertook in the, in the vaccination program based on that research. And we need to invest in it and not just basic laboratory kinds of, of, of science. I think that it, it may be reasonable. I don't know. I think to me, the, the Biggest issue is to continue to monitor coverage, to continue to assess what is what people feel are causing the problem, and then to find my when I my director of communications when I was director of the U.S. Immunization Program used to say, "You need the right message delivered by the right messenger through the right communications channel," and we need to to do it because I'm just not sure since the people who gain from the lottery are a very limited number of people, whether that's gonna really address the hesitancy problem that we have to overcome. I hope it does. I, I would just <laughs> I add know. that there are a lot of tropes out there about you know the Tuskegee syphilis study and there's vaccine hesitancy because of that. It's mostly a, a question of access. And people being, you know, given the opportunity to to get it in their communities and get get ready access to the vaccine, and I think we can fall into stereotypes and sort of historically inaccurate, you know, sort of uh, rationales for vaccination hesitancy, and we're missing the target. And I think we need to be more transparent and give uh, people the community. I think one thing that would be really helpful is to get, you know, this to primary care doctors who are trusted providers uh, and build upon those relationships as well. 
Yes, I'm, I'm struck by how it seems that most of the things that we're trying all are based on the assumption that we the people don't want the vaccine. And there doesn't don't seem to be as many resources dedicated to the fact that there are likely many people who do want the vaccine, but either for because of other barriers can't get there. Um, what do you think about I would I'd ask uh, either Mayor Gallego or Dr. Khadun to comment on that. Like, do do you think we need how might we invest to, to get the vaccines where they need to be? We have been seeing great uptank when we do employer-based events. So when we go to people's office and make it super easy or go out in the field for people who uh, work in the field. We've had some success with faith-based community events. So we, um, I think uh, two weekends ago, we're at a Catholic church uh, where they do mass in Spanish and the from the pulpit, the endorsement of the vaccination was really meaningful and people were there. So um, that was something. As I've spoken to people who are getting vaccinated, though, um, I think we should not underestimate the power of family. Several people have told me their kids kept nagging them until they did it. Uh, they were very interested in, well, they were interested in doing it, but didn't feel the urgency. And then their kids said, you gotta start doing it. Um, and, and for others, if there's just some sort of, of deadline that maybe inspires people who Originally, we're waiting until the lines went down or, or for a variety of other reasons, but um, need something to give them that, that final push. Um, and again, we also um, are, are trying to reach people creatively. I think if you read the news, get a newspaper or watch television, you probably have access to information about vaccinations, but we, we do have people in our community who don't have internet at home and um, who really rely on word of mouth. So we are trying to be creative about getting that information to people uh, in our community as well. And I would just add, you know, one thing we've tried to do is be very um, in intentional. And then that's kind of how, how public health, good public health works. I've been in two, led two local health departments, bringing services into communities and where people are is just so important. We're even doing homebound as I know other states are as well. But I think too, one of the challenges with our rollout was the real uh, push for speed, especially in the very beginning. This push for speed, this push for these mass vaccination efforts, literally as a state health official, you were measured publicly across the entire country on the national news every, you know, every night on how fast you are and where you rank. But to do this intentional neighborhood-based work, you're not gonna get 2000 necessarily shots in an arm, when you're going into community members, into, into neighborhoods. And so I, I know quite frankly, the mission was probably a little bit slower um, because we were from the very beginning, very intentional about some of our neighborhood-based strategies. And that's a decision that we made um, just to promote health equity. I think that's that's one of the challenges why I roll out, not to mention to the earlier point about primary care offices, there was a push, don't, don't you know, these 10 dose, 14 dose vials, don't you dare waste a drop. I'm still right now meeting with physician organizations saying that's three months ago. Like if you find, if you have someone in your office, please, please sign up for this COVID vaccination program. If you have someone in your office who want, is ready and wants a shot right now, have it there so you can give it to them. I don't want any vaccine wastage, don't get me wrong. I wish we had single dose vials, but literally doctors were turning people away saying, I'm not gonna be able to use all 10 doses. So therefore you can't get a shot today. And that's, that's really not excusable. Appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Finn, just because of time, this might be our last question, but um, there was one that, that came in from more than one attendee and I wanted to, to direct it towards you. So a number of people watching have appreciated your suggestion of a national monument or day of remembrance. Why do you think measures like this are so important to healing and national solidarity? I think it becomes a symbolic uh, moment for all of us to come together. I mean, uh, you know, the, you know, the, the red states or blue states, it could be a purple monument, you know, that we can all, you know, uh, speak to and, and grieve over. Um, I, I think that's really important. And I think the power of symbolism to motivate us to do what we, we you know, we, we to, to strive for our better angels, as it were. Um, uh, it may seem a little hokey. It, it may seem uh, romantic, but we need to be motivated. We need to be motivated to be our better selves. Um, and and I, need, I think we need to honor the doctors and nurses and, and other clinicians who work so hard, the first responders, 
but we also have to honor the memory of those we've lost. And, and so look at the power of the Vietnam War Memorial. Um, that was a very divisive war. The country was fractured and people have come together in front of that beautiful monument. And it has had a healing presence. After all, we're healers and a monument like that could be healing for us. Well, it's probably good to end on an uplifting note in that way, um, given that this is certainly not the end of the pandemic, and if anything, perhaps the beginning of the end of the pandemic. But I think you know much of what you've spoken to tonight, all four of you, uh, has been on the you know sort of confronting the fact that that there's not just a lot of work to be done, but that we're going to have to find ways to live in this new world uh, with COVID. Um, that it's not something we're getting rid of very soon, um, if perhaps ever. Uh, but there are probably better ways for us to find ways. You know, to 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 live with COVID and to figure out what the world will look like uh, in the near future in a better and safer world. Um, that'll conclude today's webinar. Our next webinar will take place Wednesday, June twentieth. Oh no! Twenty third. I apologize. I just got cut off. So um, I'm just sorry I got cut off. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what's gone wrong here, so I apologize. But uh, our it, it, our next webinar will be oh, I'm sorry Wednesday, June 23rd at 5 p.m. Eastern time, and will be on the subject of the international response to COVID-19. Um, everyone who's registered for today's webinar will receive an invitation to the next webinar. This webinar has been recorded. Uh, the recording, a transcript, and the slide presentations will be available on COVID19conversations.org. I want to thank again all of our panelists, all four of them, and as well to the National Academy of Medicine and to the American Public Health Association for co-sponsoring this webinar series. And thanks most of all to all of you and our listeners and those who've watched for joining us today. Best wishes to all of you for health and safety and take care.